What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. All right, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. All right, so for this case, we've got a 67 year old female, and she's presenting with a one month history of difficulty swallowing, hoarse voice, changes in taste and left-sided neck pain. So we have an elderly woman. She's got a one-month history of this difficulty swallowing. So in terms of cranial nerves, what you want to think about there is cranial nerve 10 or the vagus nerve. Hoarse voice, again, that's going to be cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. Changes in taste could be either the facial nerve or the glossopharyngeal nerve, which will be cranial nerve 7 and 9, respectively. And then left-sided neck pain, that could be a number of things. That could be some musculoskeletal pain. It could be a swollen lymph node. We'll just keep that in mind as we move along here. Past medical history is notable for Elher-Danlos syndrome. So that's significant because they can have joint hypermobility, other musculoskeletal problems. Uh, they can also have cardiovascular problems such as aneurysms. So you definitely want to keep that in mind as well. The vitals are 37 degrees Celsius. So she's afebrile. Heart rate is 108, so she's tachycardic. She's got a very elevated heart rate, especially for someone who's resting or not active. Blood pressure is 142 over 90, so she's definitely hypertensive here. And then respiration rate is 18, so definitely elevated respiration rate. On physical exam, extraocular muscle movements, facial expression, and hearing are intact bilaterally. So extraocular muscle movement, this can corresponds to cranial nerve three, the ocular motor, cranial nerve four, the trochlear nerve, and then cranial nerve six, the abducens nerve. So those are all intact. Facial expression is cranial nerve seven, facial nerve, and then hearing intact bilaterally is cranial nerve eight, vestibular cochlear. So those are all intact. So they're just going through the cranial nerves and testing them. Facial sensation to light touch and pinprick is intact bilaterally. So that's cranial nerve five or the trigeminal nerve, so that's intact. And then the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles are have five out of five motor strength bilaterally. And so that's gonna be cranial nerve 11 would be the accessory, so that nerve is intact. The position of the uvula is shown in the picture here. So again, just getting you practice with looking at pictures like this of, of patients, uh, especially with phys unique physical exam findings. So again, this is the right side, this is the left side, here's the uvula, and then you see deviation of, uvula, of the uvula this way towards the right, away from the left side. So that's important to remember. And, and deviation of the uvula often invo can involve cranial nerve 9 or the glossopharyngeal, and in this case it's deviation away from the lesion. So if it's the left-sided cranial, cranial nerve 9, the uvula would deviate to the right as we see here. So we want to keep that in mind as well as we go along. The tongue is in neutral position, and that's cranial nerve 12, or hypoglossal nerve, so that's intact. And then we look at here, we test some reflexes. The pupillary and the corneal reflexes are intact bilaterally. So with these reflexes, what you want to pay attention to and keep in mind is what, really what you're testing is the, is the sensory limb and the motor limb. And so each of these are carried by a cranial nerve. And so if we look at the pupillary reflex, the sensory limb is carried by cranial nerve 2, or the optic nerve, which makes sense, you're shining light into the eye, and then the motor is by cranial nerve 3, or the ocular motor nerve. Then if we look at the corneal reflex, so sensory for the corneal reflex is the ophthalmic nerve, which is the first division of the trigeminal nerve, so that's the sensory, and then the motor component is the facial nerve. And this is where you're testing essentially blinking. You have a cotton swab and you'll put it close to the eye and test for blinking, which would be the sensory of that would be cranial nerve five. And then the motor component would be, you know, closing the eye, which would be cranial nerve seven, facial nerve. And then lastly, here we have the gag reflex. So it says here the gag reflex is absent. So that's important here. So the sensory component of that is the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve nine. And then the motor component is the vagus nerve. So we're seeing a lot of things pop up here with the vagus nerve and the glossopharyngeal. So definitely want to keep that in mind. The voice is hoarse, 
And so that's definitely going to be cranial nerve 10 because the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So that's definitely significant. The recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is a branch of the vagus nerve, helps contribute to voice production. And this is consistent with what the patient is, con is complaining of. And then we say here, it's a pulsatile mass is palpated in the left side of the neck. So pulsatile would tend to be, make me more suspicious of a vascular lesion, potentially an aneurysm. All right, so let's clean this up and really focus on the key exam findings and the key components of the history. A lot of normal findings on the exam, but definitely some really unique abnormal findings as well. And so for the history, again, you know, she's got this difficulty swallowing, the hoarse voice, changes in taste, the left-sided neck pain, and then the Hellhurst Danlow syndrome in her history as well. And these correspond to a lot of what we found on exam as well. So absent gag reflex, again, that's cranial nerves 9 and 10. Uvula devi deviated to the right, that's again cranial nerve 9, hoarse voice, cranial nerve 10, and then this left-sided pulsatile mass is consistent with an aneurysm, which would also cause some neck pain as well, potentially. All right, so given that we probably think this is a cranial nerve lesion, let's take a look at answer choice A here, because it does not involve a cranial nerve lesion. So the cervical sympathetic fibers, if those are damaged, you can see that you can see those damaged by a carotid artery dissection. And if they were to be damaged, you would see Horner syndrome, which would be ipsilateral ptosis, which would be drooping of the eyelid on the ipsilateral side, anhydrosis, which is denervation to the sweat glands, so you'd see dry skin, and then meiosis, which is constriction of the pupil. And the patient isn't presenting with any of these findings on exam or in the history at all. So I think we can safely eliminate that answer choice. So now let's just go through with the really main functions of these cranial nerves involved in the other answer choices. So the facial nerve, as you can see here, it it comes out here and, it's, and it shoots all these branches off all to these different muscles within the face. And so that would you know, be re obviously responsible for its main function, which is motor innervation to facial muscles. It also has branches that go to provide taste sensation from the anterior two thirds of the tongue, and then motor innervation to the stapedius muscle of the middle ear. And that helps with dampening loud noises to the ear. So the vestibular cochlear nerve or cranial nerve eight so if we go over here and look at the internal acoustic meatus, which is this opening right here, and we see it blown up here, this is where cranial nerve 8, as we show here, it's labeled the acoustic. This is an older diagram. And then the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7. So they both exit the skull base via this foramen. And the vestibular cochlear nerve, the main thing is hearing. It's responsible for transmitting hearing. And then it also transmits balance information from the inner ear to the brain to help with coordination and balance and things like that. And then the glossopharyngeal nerve, so you can see this here, it travels with the vagus nerve in the head and neck here. And so you can see it coming down here and it supplies a number of branches to different structures within the head and neck. Main points you want to take away here is it does taste to the posterior and one thirds of the tongue. So if you have the tongue like this, the anterior two thirds is cranial nerve seven, and then the posterior one third is cranial nerve 9, glossopharyngeal. The other thing is it has general sensation from the oropharynx and the posterior one third of the tongue. So it does taste sensation and then general sensation, you know, such as touch or pinprick. It receives sensory information from the carotid bodies and carotid sinus to help with regulating blood pressure and heart rate. And then it also provides the sensory limb for the gag reflex as well. And then the vagus nerve, again, you can see it here, starting, you know, exiting the head and traveling in the neck here. And then you can see where it really goes all the way down and travels from the neck into the chest and into the abdomen. And all throughout, it provides a lot of parasympathetic input to many structures in the head, the neck, the chest, and the abdomen. The other thing it's responsible for is it has the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which if you can see here, here's the vagus nerve, here's the laryngeal nerve right here. And so then you have the branch, the recurrent laryngeal, which innervates the intrinsic muscles of the larynx, which is responsible for voice production. A, a, th a key point to point out in the neck here is that it, it's involved with esophageal peristalsis, so it helps with swallowing. And then it also provides the motor limb of the gag reflex. So if we come back here and look at the answer choices, I think it's pretty safe to say we can cross off cranial nerve 7 because they would have facial droop, inability to raise eyebrow, open eye, or smile. And as we say here, facial expression is intact bilaterally. Cranial nerve 8, that you would see hearing loss, vertigo, potentially nystagmus, motion sickness, mainly hearing loss, but you could also see these balance issues as well. She's not complaining of a history of falls or, or difficulty with balance. And then her hearing, as we say here, is intact bilaterally. Cranial nerve 9, 
you would see an absent gag reflex. You could see the uvula deviated away from the lesion and then loss of taste on the posterior one third of the tongue. And so we see all of that here. We see the uvula deviated, we see an absent gag reflex, and then the patient is having changes in taste as well. Cranial nerve 10, you could see hoarse voice, difficulty swallowing. You could also see an absent gag reflex as well with cranial nerve 10 uh, lesions. The other thing is these rarely happen in isolation in the head and neck, usually because they travel together. You can't have a lesion affecting one nerve without the other. And so given that we've crossed out these two answer choices, I think it's fair to say we can cross out answer choice F, B, and C. And then lastly here, answer choice G, D, and E would be damage to the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve, which like I said, a lesion typically affects both of those just given the proximity that, of their course within the head and neck. So let's come back here and address that painful pulsatile mass in the left side of her neck. So if you look here, here's the common carotid artery. And remember, it travels up and it bifurcates into the ICA, the internal carotid artery, and the ECA, the external carotid artery. And the internal carotid artery obviously goes to the brain. And then this provides a number of uh, blood supply to facial structures. So if you look here, here's that ECA. You can see it's starting to provide some of those branches. Here's the ICA here. And as you can see, here's your vagus nerve and your glossopharyngeal nerve here. And so if you see where it travels up like this, it continues traveling obviously up here into the brain. If you have an aneurysm, like it seems our patient has, you would have this mass like this impinging on both these vagus and glossopharyngeal nerves, which would cause problems with, their, with the structures they innervate. And then you could also have on you know, exam a pulsatile mass that could, that could lead to pain as we see in our patient. So again, it seems the answer choice most likely is D and E, answer choice G, which would be damage to cranial nerve 9 and 10 as a result of a left-sided carotid aneurysm. All right, that's all I have for you this week. Make sure you check back every Wednesday for new Da Vinci cases. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel for more videos, and then be sure to download the PDF notes for this video on our website at dviacademy.com. Also on our site, you can find our book and video packages for anatomy and biochemistry. And if you want to listen to DaVinci Cases on the go, the audio is available on Spotify. You can also follow us on Instagram for weekly posts and video. And then lastly, if you have any questions about the content of this video or about DaVinci Academy, put them in the comments and our team will be sure to answer them. All right, thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.